Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this town hall, continuing uh, our conversation about Queen's uh, strategy for the future, its values and aspirations. Uh, really grateful to have you join us this afternoon. Um, even though we're meeting virtually, uh, I want to acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We're grateful to be able to live, to learn uh, and play on these lands. It's my understanding that this territory is included in the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the areas Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee roots. And there is also a significant Métis community, as well as First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, I know uh, some, some of the uh, registrants present on the call today have attended earlier uh, town halls, and so welcome back. And I hope you won't find too much here that is repetitive. Um, I will be talking about the evolving vision uh, and mission framework. Uh, so there should be something new here for you. For others who are attending uh, this town hall for the first time, um, I'll explain a little bit about my, what my hopes are for these, these discussions and where they're headed. Um, the meeting will be recorded and posted on my website tomorrow. This is we do partly to retain uh, in a crystal clear way, the memory of people's questions and observations, but also to make these sessions available to anybody who is interested in, in watching them. Uh, if you do have any thoughts about any of the issues raised in the town hall today, please submit them through the website, uh, or you can send them to me at principal at queensu.ca. Uh, the purpose of these sessions is uh, to elicit feedback and I've had a great deal of very, very helpful uh, input during this process. And I encourage uh, everyone on the call today to make use of those other means of uh, making sure that your thoughts about this process uh, reach me uh, and can be considered as the process continues. Um, we've had uh, a number of sessions like this, uh, as I say, uh, and we will be continuing the conversation with various groups over the next few weeks. Um, today's discussion uh, should run about an hour. It could go a bit longer if there is sufficient interest and uh, uh, enough questions to, to warrant that. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, set the scene for the discussion and um, I'll, I'll do that using uh, some slides. What I'd like to do is show you um, an outline of the process uh, uh, on which we're engaged at the moment and where all this is supposed to lead. Uh, and then I will put up a few slides that uh, give you a sense of where the evolving strategic framework uh, for the university is at this stage. It has been evolving through each of these sessions. Um, I've gone back and reworked components of it in response to observations and questions. Uh, and so I'll give you a sense of where it is, and then I'll be very eager to hear from you your thoughts about um, the uh, vision, mission, values, and strategic goals uh, as they are evolving and anything that uh, is, hasn't been sufficiently noticed in, in those goals. So um, that's what I hope uh, we'll be able to do today. Uh, so here in front of you is uh, an outline of the process by which um, I hope to uh, present to the board uh, a strategy for the university for the next, I mean, I think we need to think about the next decade um, uh, uh, through a process which has involved a great deal of consultation and discussion uh, of this sort um, uh, over the last year or so. You'll remember uh, that Queen's last strategic framework, we don't actually have a long history of strategic documents governing our planning and evolution. Um, there was in the, let me see, around uh, between 2005 and 2008, there was a strategic plan developed, uh, which um, I, I don't believe was implemented in any thoroughgoing way. And then uh, in 2014, 
uh, we developed or at least the board approved a strategic framework for Queens 2014 to 2019. Uh, so that document has now expired and that is why we're in the process now of uh, considering what a new strategy should be for the university. The board, uh, as I've said in all of the sessions, um, has ownership of strategy under our bylaws uh, and uh, it is the board that has to sign off on a new framework as they did the last time. So I'll show you here uh, on this chart how uh, that will happen and what will follow that process. And uh, it'll give you a sense of what it is that I'm hoping to put in front of the board. Uh, we're in the phase, uh, the January, February phase of consultation. And this meeting is a part of that whole process. Um, you'll remember that I brought out last October the report on the conversation, which was my account of what I'd heard from our university community during the previous year, so from October 2019 until October 2020. Um, uh, everything I'd heard about our aspirations, our values, uh, our frustrations, uh, our, the obstacles to achieving our goals and so on. And so the document that uh, described what I heard appeared last October and now I've been in the process through these kinds of meetings of validating that document. Um, I've been asking the question, well, does this accurately capture some of the most salient aspects of our institutional life at the moment and our frustrations and aspirations? And then I've been wanting to modulate that into something that sort of moves away from the diagnostic. And I mean, some would say of that document, critical perspective on the university towards something more positive, in other words, to answer the question, what strategy is implied by the report on the conversation, which, as you'll recall, has a subtitle, um, a components of an emerging strategy. So I'm now, in a sense, trying to be explicit on what that strategy is uh, and to move from diagnosis and analysis to um, uh, the articulation of some broader goals for the university. So uh, what I'm after is a strategic framework, not a fully uh, blown strategic plan, um, but uh, a very succinct and uh, economical statement of our vision for the university, our understanding of its mission now in the present time, um, the values which uh, uh, now and always should underpin the work that we do here, uh, and uh, also a number of the strategic goals, which are definitely um, discernible and implicit there in the report on the conversation. So you'll, you'll see how I've tried to capture those in the document. So the plan is, if you look at the second box along, I will move much more rapidly through the stuff than I'm doing right now, I promise you. Um, the second box there um, for, uh, foresees uh, approval of this high level framework, this very succinct document by the Board of Trustees at its March meeting. So that's not too far away. Um, and th the point at which the board says, yes, this looks like uh, um, uh, a satisfactory, acceptable um, articulation of our goals and aspirations, that will then uh, signal the uh, the beginning of a, a, a phase of planning implementation. So you'll see a number of working groups around the strategic goals envisaged to come into being around the time that the framework itself is approved. Uh, these so-called implementation working groups then would do their work uh, over the summer. They would do in consultation with our community, the, they would hold uh, the kinds of discussions I'm doing now, but much more focused on particular issues, research, internationalization, and so on. Um, and all of this under the oversight of, as always, a steering committee. And you'll see it's mentioned there in July and August. Uh, the work of these uh, working groups eventually uh, moves on up to consideration by a steering committee, which then, uh, in a sense, finalizes um, the whole strategic instrument, which would be in a sense, a, a combination of the high level uh, framework, which will be approved in March, 
and supplemented by implementation goals and much more operational considerations that will emerge through those, those working groups. And when we have that, uh, I envisage the end of the summer, uh, we will be in a position uh, to finalize what will already have been underway for uh, quite a long time, that is a communication strategy. What, how do we want to talk about this vision for the university, these goals in our public statements, in our public presentation, in the way in which the institution brands itself and uh, positions itself uh, in the sector and in society more broadly. So all of these things then come together uh, for endorsement by the board uh, in September, uh, the strategic framework, the um, implementation plan uh, and an engagement strategy or communications plan. Um, and that should then conclude this uh, process of strategic thinking and self-reflection, uh, uh, self which we've been engaged on since uh, October of 2019. Uh, but I think it will set us up for a very um, positive and uh, inspiring future as an institution. So that's the process. And uh, I, I just wanted uh, everyone to be clear on, on how what we're doing today fits into that. So anything, you know, any questions you ask today, any suggestions you make, uh, any uh, um, obs observations you, you care to offer, uh, those will weigh in the refining and uh, uh, tidying up of the strategic framework um, as it evolves towards that its approval in March. So Keith, if you wouldn't mind moving on to the first, the next slide, uh, this is the articulation of uh, a vision. Uh, I, th I think many people on the call will know about the whole mission, um, mission, vision, mission structure of uh, strategic documents. Um, uh, the, the vision, of course, is typically the very high level aspiration of the institution. It's, it's a way of talking not about our operations, but about, I suppose, uh, the answer to the question that I put at the start of the conversation is, what's the purpose of our being here? What, what contribution do we make uh, to the world? And so uh, some of you who've been on earlier calls will have seen different versions of the vision statement. You'll certainly have seen a different order of these things. I, I had mission before vision uh, a number of uh, iterations ago. So um, now uh, as a result of uh, consultations over the last little while, this is the way in which uh, the vision is being articulated in the document at the present time. Queen's community addresses the world's most significant and urgent challenges with a commitment to collaboration, innovation and excellence. Uh, this is a way of picking up, uh, you'll remember, on the, the, the major first section of the report on the conversation, which talks about um, people's desire for the university to have and to articulate and to pursue a global purpose, a compelling global purpose, uh, a goal that is greater than ourselves and our own existence. Um, it's what we want to do to serve the world. So. Um, I think the vision statement as it is here is, is not perhaps yet inspiring enough. Uh, people have raised with me the sort of the slightly tired nature of uh, talk of innovation and maybe there's a different way of articulating that and I'm certainly eager for any thoughts about, uh, about that or anything else in this. But then if you move on, uh, Keith, to the next one, this is the mission statement. So here, by the way, I'm asking everyone on the call to demonstrate the phenomenal ability to photographically recall all of these, these uh, uh, dimensions of the document uh, so that you'll, you'll be able to recall them in our conversation a bit later on. So here's the mission. Queen's is the university for the future. We stand on a history of strength, but are unafraid to challenge assumptions of the past. Offering an exceptional student experience, we attract and cultivate excellence and the capacity for leadership in people. We drive forward the boundaries of knowledge through research. And we do all this in service to an inclusive and sustainable vision for society. 
There are quite a few things here from the conversation. Um, in that statement, Queens is the University for the Future, there is a great deal uh, from the report on the conversation about the need, uh, in some ways we've articulated it as the decolonizing of the university. Um, in, in the report, uh, there, there's talk about the need for the university to find um, a new place for itself in, in contemporary society and in our, our country at the present time. So there's the recognition that we do have a remarkable history, but equally we are unafraid to challenge that history, our own history, as we've done very recently in connection with the law building. Um, uh, but of course, as a university, we exist to challenge all previously held assumptions. So that has a kind of an academic import as well there. So then uh, touching on the traditional way in which we've thought of as our Kind of differentiating uh, feature, the offering of an exceptional student experience, um, and uh, I think reiterating what must be uh, in the long term an important part of Queen's mission, which is our ability to attract uh, brilliant, talented, and energetic people uh, with a capacity for leadership and to be a place of influence that produces people of influence in the world, all in the name of that kind of more progressive forward-looking forward vision, which is implied at the start of this mission statement. And then, of course, the other side of what the institution does, though I don't see these things as antithetical, I see them as uh, uh, very much intersecting. We drive forward the boundaries of knowledge through research. And why do we do it? We do all of this in service to an inclusive and sustainable vision for society. And here I'm picking up on that really re powerful recurring theme of the conversation uh, that we need to name and define and pursue a meaningful global purpose for the university. So then I'll move on, uh, Keith, if you don't mind, to the, the declaration of values. Uh, there's a whole section in the report on the conversation that talks about the quality of our community. Uh, and that is a category of observations that includes e EDII, questions of racism and anti-racism, uh, but it also gets down to the nuts and bolts of how we interact with each other, um, the, our tolerance for risk, um, our mutual, our approach to, to uh, mutual support in the organization, the kind of workplace we are, uh, a critical issue because when I reflect on that report on the conversation, this, the question of the quality of our university community measured uh, by these values is a critical one. And it's there we have to, have to make improvements in order to really maximize the, uh, the impact this university can have. So at the moment, this draft statement of values uh, uh, reads as follows. Collegiality, generosity, trust and respect animate our interactions. I should point out, I always do, although it seems rather cynical to do that. Um, th this is not a description of what we are day to day. It's what we should be day to day, uh, but it does uh, at least seek to lay out those values which we should seek every day to have guide our interactions and our behavior um, uh, in the workplace. We come together to generate and disseminate knowledge for the greater good, committing ourselves to truth, creativity, innovation, and the power of the mind to advance science and technology and to find solutions. We uphold unequivocally the principles of academic freedom. Equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigenization, as well as a sense of responsibility for the planet and all the life it sustains, these imperatives frame the mission and vision of Queen's University. Uh, so uh, I'll just comment there. I mean, I, I, I did already talk about the importance of EDII in that section of the report that talks about the quality of our community. Uh, just a, a word there about the responsibility for the planet and all the life it sustains. In the report on the conversation, there is the recommendation made 
that we uh, actively and consciously adopt something like the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations to help order and align the work we do so as to maximize our impact. I'm not sure uh, that a university with the breadth of talent and areas of expertise that we have uh, needs to or perhaps should name the Sustainable Development Goals in things like the mission and vision statements. Um, but uh, it clearly, and you'll see this when I show you the goals, that notion of sustainability and a commitment to sustainability in all its dimensions. And if you know the Sustainable Development Goals, you'll know there are 17 of them which cover every possible obstacle to human happiness, health and prosperity on the planet um, as, as a paradigm for aligning the activities of a major research institution, it's pretty hard to beat the sustainable development goals. And you'll see, I do name them in one of the strategic goals, uh, but that's that component of the report on the conversation is what I pick up here uh, in this uh, uh, final sentence of the values statement um, in the responsibility for the planet. Um, Okay, so now I'll just move on uh, quickly, if I may, to show you strategic goals. So none of these will surprise you if you uh, have read the report on the conversation. Um, what, what this document does is it now tries to identify those areas sort of earmarked for, uh, for work um, in the report on the conversation as goals which will facilitate um, our achievement of the mission and vision as it's articulated here. So we will achieve our vision and our commitment to making a global impact by one, increasing the intensity and volume of exemplary groundbreaking and interdisciplinary research, whether fundamental applied or driven through community partnership. Um, so we do, I think, uh, how should I put this, throughout the conversation, the need for Queen's to raise its research strength, uh, enhance uh, the importance of research across the culture of our institution, and for us to play more aggressively uh, on the stage of international research institutions. This was a recurring theme of the conversation. So obviously it is a goal uh, and here it is articulated as the first. Um, there's no attempt here to say, you know, as some people have asked me about sustainable development goals and said, well, you know, not all research has that kind of easily foreseeable application. Of course not. So I've tried to, tried to register here the full breadth of the types of research that already occur here uh, as being all equally important to the the intellectual productivity of an institution of our standing. Um, the last one, a research driven through community partnership, very exciting field. Uh, I know many uh, uh, members of our community are already engaged in community-based or engaged research and teaching projects. And it's that that I particularly wanted to signal there. And that picks up the notion of partnership with a community that was an important uh, issue in the report on the conversation. So Keith, uh, on to the second goal. I will console everybody by saying there are only five of these, so I will soon be done with this, with this little mini lecture. Um, so here's the second of the goals, uh, and this speaks to the other side of our interconnected mission. Um, in fact, that interconnectedness is, is uh, part of the next of the goals, but here second through innovative pedagogies and leveraging new technologies reconceiving educational programs at both the undergraduate and graduate levels so as to better prepare, prepare students to have impact. Uh, uh, that I think is straightforward. That speaks to a very serious um, uh, intervention in uh, the quality of teaching and learning uh, and uh, creative and new ways of pursuing the pedagogical mission of the institution. The third of the goals, of course, is sees the bringing together of the teaching and research mission in a significant way. And you'll remember if you 
read the report on the conversation that this is viewed as one of the ways in which an institution facing relatively constrained um, resources in the both the short and the longer term uh, can maximize its research impact. So here, you'll remember the rubric that goes with this, you know, we will uh, um, yeah, enhance our impact by enhancing the interdependence of the research and teaching missions, especially through the greater integration of research in the undergraduate experience and an increase in the proportion of graduate students. Uh, we can move on to the next one, Keith, thanks. So you'll remember then the towards the end of the report on the conversation, um, uh, the the theme turns to partnership um, and uh, um, uh, ways in which the university should discharge its global and social mission through uh, outreach uh, and various forms of partnership. Um, so here we have uh, in four and five, we have two ways in which Queen's position can be strengthened. And here the first one, the globally, by developing and implementing a comprehensive integrated program of internationalization that includes not only student and faculty mobility, the old way of understanding internationalization, but also curriculum reform intended to capture a pluralistic global environment. What I've often said about internationalization, if it's done right, is that like indigenization, it will change us. It must change us, otherwise we're not doing it correctly. And so this goal here is, is pointing us towards a thoroughgoing reconsideration of what we do um, uh, through that aspiration uh, to be a participant in a pluralistic global environment. And so obviously uh, that has ramifications for curriculum as it does for uh, the more obvious forms of international engagement uh, in, in student and faculty mobility. And then finally, um, uh, uh, another form of engagement this time with uh, our local community. And this is a, another way in which we can strengthen our position, building deliberate strategic, respectful, and mutually beneficial engagement with communities outside the university, including the city and region, other organizations and institutions, as well as our national and global networks that share our goals. I think uh, just a word about the relationship between goals four and five. Um, these are not separate things. Uh, if one is thinking about a university that has impact, uh, social and global impact, that impact begins right here at home. So we do not have to be an institution, uh, to be a, an institution of global significance, we don't have to only be doing our work in, in regions of the world remote from Kingston and Ontario. In fact, um, our mission uh, to advance uh, uh, society and global sustainability it begins right here at home. So goals four and five are essentially two versions of the same thing. Um, and they're both premised on the same idea, which is that uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot be an island as an institution. Our reputation, our impact, our capacity to, to um, advance uh, our overall mission depends very much on our developing to a high degree a capacity for productive, uh, thoughtful and respectful partnership uh, with other parties, communities, businesses, other universities, national governments, not-for-profits, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm going to, that, that gives you a sense of how this strategic framework document is evolving. Um, uh, it's, as I say, headed uh, towards the point at which the approval of the, the board will be sought in, in March. And I'm eager to hear your thoughts about it or uh, to have a conversation with everyone on the call about any aspect of the report on the conversation that you'd care to raise 
uh, particularly, I suppose, things that are not, in your view, reflected in what I put up here on the screen, but that you think is uh, uh, that important. So uh, thanks, Keith. You can take down the slides. Um, and I'll turn to Mary Beth, um, who can uh, put any questions to me that you, you, you might have put. I think the place to put questions, Mary Beth, would be in the chat. Yeah, am I right? Yeah, that? well, you can you can use the chat, but we would actually prefer the Q&A window. So there's a little Q&A uh, toggle at the bottom there, and you can use that to enter your question. Um, someone was asking, uh, Patrick, when you outline the process that you're going through right now, uh, there was no mention of Senate. So could you talk a little bit about yeah. Senate's involvement in this process? Yeah, Senate, Senate is critically important. So I will be uh, presenting to Senate at its next meeting. Um, uh, the uh, the next uh, iteration of this framework uh, and be seeking the the input of Senate there. Obviously, any any program change that underpins these goals or anything that is required um, uh, in order to achieve these directions that requires the approval of Senate uh, normally will require the approval of Senate um, in order to achieve this. So. Uh, this is not in any way to, um, to prejudge uh, decisions that Senate may make about program or enrollment or anything of that sort, anything that's normally within the purview of Senate. Um, this is merely, I think, to articulate uh, a direction for the university that, in a sense, we're all trajectory we're already on uh, to judge from the conversations I had, but it's to give it purpose and a kind of clean direction. But I will go to Senate uh, and seek Senate's uh, reflections and thoughts on this uh, at the February meeting of Senate. I'd also say that um, there have been discussions in the Senate about the, the precursor document, the report on the conversation. Um, I've also met with uh, faculty boards. Uh, I've met uh, quite broadly across the university with uh, different constituencies. So uh, my my, my hope is that what is reflected both in the report on the conversation and in, in, in the articulation of these goals, though people might differ on the words, um, is, is uh, reasonably consistent. Um, uh, I think the, the point at which uh, I can imagine uh, decisions uh, being required at Senate will be in the implementation phase, because it is there that uh, I'm anticipating working groups led back to the Europeans, uh, looking at different dimensions uh, raised by those goals um, and uh, whatever changes there are to our academic life that are normally within the purview of Senate will have to be deliberated and uh, resolved, approved at Senate in the normal way. It's, I, I should say, I mean, it's, a, it's an, un, an unusual situation, uh, I think, from a governance point of view, that um, uh, here at Queen's, the, the board owns strategy, so it makes it somewhat unclear uh, by what process one, one should arrive at a strategy that the board will consider. And I've tried, I've tried to manage that by a high degree of consultation um, and uh, the, the whole exercise beginning in October of 2019 till now intended to gather up um, opinion and uh, 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 thoughts about our future and aspirations uh, from the grassroots on up uh, in the institution. Um, and uh, it's, it's the, uh, I, I suppose now I'm trying to gather that into some kind of summary form to take it forward. Uh, uh, we have a question. So in your thoughtful report, you propose to use the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as strategic research areas for Queen's. However, the official targets and indicators for many of these are focused on impact in developing countries, while Tri-Council research grants require benefit to Canada. Yeah. Could you clarify how you envision using the SDGs as strategic goals for Queen's? Yeah. Uh, for example, maybe only using the title of each SDG, but not the official targets. Yeah, what a, what a thoughtful question. Thanks very much for that one. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I said in my opening comments that the SDGs are a useful paradigm. I, uh, I, I don't for a minute believe that they are a paradigm to be slavishly followed, although I will say there are universities around the world that have adopted them uh, almost wholesale and, and arranged their operations around them. I'm thinking of the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, which is an amazing operation. Um, and uh, in terms of its demonstrable impact under the goals, quite extraordinary. Um, and around the world, you know, there are universities that adopt one or two as part of their mission. Uh, and universities form themselves into networks. This has been mediated through the International Association of Universities, networks of universities, let's say working on one goal um, uh, for in, from different parts of the globe. So I think um, there are many different ways in which the SDGs can be useful. I think the question was really astute in that last point in that um, what the SDGs provide us with uh, is a series of categories of areas in which work needs to be done. The last goal 17 is of course all about partnerships for the goals. Uh, and in a way that last goal, here they are, you can see um, the, the 17th uh, uh, gives us a clear indication of you know, how institutions and organizations can go about maximizing their own impact uh, in any of these areas. Um, now, I th I'd say it's actually a, a rare institution, and you might say a kind of foolhardy institution that thinks it should commit itself to all 16 of the uh, substantive goals. But it's not unreasonable to look at this and say, well, you know, just off the top of my head, I could point to actually quite a number of these in which Queen's already makes a contribution. Uh, maybe we want to name them, uh, uh, you know, given you know, you might say our, our long history in, 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 let's say, policy formation, policy studies and development, peace, justice and strong institutions, you might say, uh, you know, I mean, there are, there are, I think everybody watching can, can, can see in the 16 goals uh, uh, areas where the work that they do, whether it is through the area in which they teach or the research uh, on which they work can, can have an impact here. Um, so, before I get to the whole question of the relationship between the targets and what we might do, I think I'd say um, it's just worth taking note of the remarkable work that a group uh, uh, led by uh, Sandra Donata uh, and, and Michael Fraser did in preparation for our submission to the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, because uh, that process involved taking stock of Queen's work under these uh, 16, 17 categories. And so we now know in a way we didn't six months ago, um, uh, what in substantive terms we, we can point to under each of these headings uh, that would be worth developing um, and uh, uh, expanding upon in some way. Um, and, you know, there are questions around the, the SDGs that are important to ask. You know, there are SDGs that speak to what we already do well. But there are also SDGs that speak to what universities should think about uh, as part of their mission. You can look at number four there as clearly um, a goal in which we have to be a, a player. Um, so um, we are, I'd say we're not yet at the point of saying, okay, of the 16 substantive goals, um, the following five are the ones we might want to put our energies into, uh, but we will get there. Uh, and I think that is part of the process uh, on which these implementation groups would be engaged. I think there will need to be a group working on, let's say, our, our research goals, and they will ponder uh, where, where our strengths reside under these categories. But, you know, I mean, similarly, uh, these, these goals bear on um, uh, curriculum design at the undergrad level. Uh, so... Uh, and any number of the working groups will, I think, turn, have to turn their attention either to these goals as articulated um, uh, by the UN or to some similar set of categories in which we want to have an impact. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by going back to what I think was the first point of the question, which was the, yeah, the, the, the UN goals are very, very precise um, and uh, um, 
uh, seriously quantified. Uh, and you're right, of course, uh, those are goals that are sort of envisaged to be achieved uh, in the developing world for the most part. But on the other hand, just going back to what I said about local and global engagement, uh, poverty in Kingston is maybe different in cause and different in type from poverty experienced halfway across the globe. But in addressing poverty in Kingston, we do address global poverty. Um, and I think that's the way to look at these, these goals. I think, you know, it's in, in that term sustainable development, people always assume this is really about a kind of an, an active development studies orientation of the university. And it is that because it is out of those parts of the world in which there's serious deprivation and injustice and suffering that comes the urgency for this work. But the, the region in which we operate uh, is not immune uh, to any of these problems, which is why community engaged research and teaching is so important. One need only think of the city in which we're situated. This is not a city without very serious social and other challenges. It's a great question. Thanks, thanks very much for that one. Okay, uh, we have another question from Ian Pereira. Uh, towards recognizing, supporting, and guiding activities our community is doing towards our strategic priorities, is there a means to account for such individual work at multiple levels where research may not be the priority? For example, trainees in some of our health programs conduct research for various reasons in some cases involving multi-institution or global partnerships, or they may volunteer at leadership levels in the Kingston community. Yeah. Uh, is there guidance on how these efforts may be better identified, supported and aligned with our vision, mission and values? Oh, that's a fabulous question. I mean, it's partly the realization that all those various activities which are you know, beneficial and high impact in one way or another uh, are not sufficiently recognized that I, I wrote what I did in the report on the conversation. I think a lot of the work that gets done uh, needs to be recognized and identified for its impact and its overall contribution. But universities have very narrow ways of, of recognizing and acknowledging contributions. Uh, I mean, we, we yes, uh, teaching and research drowns everything else, but for a university to have impact, uh, as much as possible of it needs to be aligned in a thoughtful way, and not a kind of uh, peremptory top-down way to, to those desired impacts, but it does need to be conscious of the impact it's trying to have and to reward activities and behaviors that advance those goals. Um, when I first started in the job, I actually uh, supported by uh, the, the, the president of the United Way went around uh, and met people at local community organizations, partly to ascertain what Queen's volunteer engagement was in the in the life of this community at the level of those social agencies. And it, 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 the evidence was extraordinary. So students, staff, faculty are very active in this community doing uh, all manner of things that benefit the quality uh, of life in the Kingston community. I don't see that as separate from the mission of the university. I in fact see that as utterly central to the mission of a university that seeks to have impact and you have impact through all those means, not just through research and teaching. So I very much applaud the sentiments in the question. Uh, and I think we have to look for ways, not just to recognize uh, work that is done uh, that uh, has a positive impact, um, but to support it and to sustain it and facilitate it as part of the overall enterprise of the university. Um, that involves, you know, I mean, at my level, it involves uh, what I'm doing now, uh, leading a process by which we can identify things like community engagement as an important priority for the university. Um, 
Uh, but it also involves having discussions with ourselves about how we give people proper recognition for the work that they do and the impact that it has uh, and how we might better uh, work to maximize that impact. And one of the most exciting things about the academy nowadays is that things uh, are evolving in, in a way that make this, um, I suppose, promote this kind of comprehensive vision of an engaged, socially responsible university. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the sphere of pedagogy, uh, community engaged teaching and learning is important, workplace uh, learning, self-directed learning, all of these things uh, potentially have the effect of taking students uh, primary locus in which they learn and form themselves away from the classroom into other kinds of settings. Uh, and I think that is uh, that uh, speaks very well towards the notion of an educational institution that is actively seeking uh, engagement with its community. Similarly, um, you know, the shift from um, you know, uh, res research to this kind of community engaged model. Uh, Fahim Kadir uh, suggested to me that we shouldn't call it community engaged, but community driven. Uh, research, uh, which is a very exciting field uh, in which researchers have this kind of equitable partnership with the community in which the issues to be investigated are identified and defined, and then the resources of the academy are brought together with the resources of the community to find solutions. It's a very exciting time as uh, the notion of what a university does is being broadened. Uh, I hope that answers the question, right? because I, I think the 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 issue of celebrating, recognizing, and supporting all the various, shall I say, less than obvious ways in which people and units within a university are aligned, let's say, to the achievement of uh, those sustainable goals is critically important if we're going to have uh, the impact we want to have. We have a question from Gail Eaton-Smith. How does the strategic plan express the notion of excellence in global and local citizenship as opposed to the focus on intellectual and academic brilliance? Hmm. Well, um, I'm not sure I would see those things as contradictory. I mean, you might say, looking at our history, uh, that we've thrown all our eggs into the intellectual excellence basket, and that is partly how we've defined ourselves. And we wouldn't be alone in being a university that's uh, formulated its um, sense of its relevance to society in those terms. Um, but, I don't really think they're mutually exclusive. In fact, I, mean, I guess what I would say is the excitement about thinking of strategy here at Queen's uh, from the point of view is, that I've been taking is that because uh, it is, if I can put it this way, a kind of high octane institution, um, it can, uh, if it manages to wean itself from being too uh, infatuated with a sense of being high octane, it can become a potent force uh, for social uh, transformation, both locally uh, and globally. Um, so I, th I, I mean, I, I would see those things as uh, not, not in the least antagonistic. Um, and in fact, uh, that, that, that is, I think, part of the appeal of thinking about our strategy as a university uh, in terms of the SDGs because we've got we've got we've got the uh, firepower here to really make a difference and here I'm talking about everybody uh, the quality of the students the quality of the faculty the dedication and quality of the staff here I mean this is potentially uh, I think I tried to say this in the report on the conversation this is a place that should have demonstrably high impact um, uh, in, in, in the world at large. Uh, but it does require us to somewhat wean ourselves off the notion of ourselves as um, 
an elite institution that attracts uh, outstanding uh, students and minds to being a place that is an institution that, attra that attracts outstanding institutions and minds devoted to a, a cause beyond themselves. Um, so then the question is, how is that going to be registered in the strategic plan? Um, uh, that's exactly the one of the key issues I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get right. And I've probably not got the language right there yet. So I, I appreciate the question I, because, um, uh, you know, excellence has to be there and it is in that uh, mission statement. Uh, but finding a way to connect that to the notion of um, social and global efficacy is key. Uh, I guess one thing I'd say about a document like this is um, it's a very high level document. Um, it, 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 it's a document we will refer to as we think about the directions we want to take. Um, uh, it can't possibly contain every, everything we would want uh, for the university. What I believe it has to do is license whatever we might want to do here. Uh, and I think that's the difference. I hope that answers the question a bit because I, uh, it's a very good question. I, I don't feel I've gotten the balance right there yet. Uh, Patrick, you've made a strong commitment to research and developing graduate programs at the university, which I think will address many of the topics addressed in your initial conversation with Queens. How do you plan to prevent this growth in graduate programs coming at the expense of undergrad students and student services that support undergraduate programming? Yeah. Well, yes, of course, this is this is a critical question. Um, you know, I say in the in the report on the conversation that uh, we, we have a model, a mechanism for the distribution of resources here that actually does not favor uh, uh, the development of research. It favors um, undergraduate learning uh, and the support of undergraduate learning, which is critically important, of course, and historically has been critically important for us, too. So we have a cultural predisposition uh, to favor um, uh, undergraduate education in, in our allocation of resources and our, our decisions about priorities. Um, I have no desire uh, in any way to detract from that remarkable uh, record we have in, term, in, the, in the quality of the student experience. In fact, I would say we need to be thoughtful about how to be more true to the promise of that reputation and uh, find ways to deepen and enrich students' experiences. Um, that's one of the reasons I make the point that I do about the integration of research in undergraduate programs. Because if you put to one side the question of growing the proportion of graduate students in the student body, and because that has legitimate obstacles we have to overcome. Um, if you put that to one side, and you assume we have two goals that are mutually reinforcing. One, deepening and enriching the kind of academic experiences students have here. And look at the Nessie survey. Our students do not say necessarily great things about what occurs in the classroom here. So there's work to be done uh, in terms of the, the academic experience we're giving them. But um, one way in which you can do that, uh, especially in an institution that attracts as much talent at the undergrad level as we do, is to uh, place a greater emphasis on self-directed learning, on research uh, curiosity-driven learning processes for undergrads. Because the effect of that then, of course, is to cause the culture of research and inquiry to be more broadly suffused across the institution. We shouldn't have this kind of stratified model that at the top are researchers asking the most rarefied questions, uh, sort of midway down are graduate students doing the same thing, um, uh, but under the supervision of uh, the, those uh, uh, faculty members. And then, then their undergrads doing something that's sort of quite different, um, largely learning, uh, receiving uh, wisdom that has uh, already been through uh, um, the hands of those from whom they are receiving it. So. Uh, student, undergrad students want to be excited by discovery. They want to have their curiosity peaked. And especially in our institution, there's no reason to think that undergrad students should not benefit from an exciting 
transformation of their learning experience uh, through the influence of research. So, um, yeah, you know, there were resources uh, included in that observation I just made. It, uh, you know, say self-directed learning uh, doesn't save anyone any money and it doesn't save faculty members any time. Uh, you might argue that it's it's more demanding. So we do have to be thoughtful about uh, about that. The question, though, of of how we properly resource research uh, in the institution, um, while keeping uh, uh, the educational mission whole, is a really important one. Um, uh, and uh, I, th I think there, as I've said on a number of occasions. Uh, we need to look at the way in which we make use of the resources we currently have, you know, in the context of a situation in which those resources are not likely to grow materially, not, not through tuition fees, not through an increase of government grant. Um, uh, um, and we now know enrollment is, is limited by government, so we can't continue on the treadmill that we've been on for years of simply growing our numbers in order to grow our revenues. So it's by no means a simple challenge. And I think the, the only way, at least one of the key strategies from which we should not shrink is to look at how we use our money and see where we can find uh, savings that can be uh, earmarked for the academic mission uh, and the research mission. Um, so there is that. On the question of the proportion Growing the proportion of graduate students in the in the student body, that is that is a challenge as as uh, uh, the dean of the graduate school has has reminded me on a number of occasions because the corridor, the enrollment corridor within which we operate, um, mixes graduate students and undergrad students. So uh, unless you go over the corridor, and, and there is a question mark over what the consequences from the institution of going over the corridor are or might be. Um, it's difficult, it's a bit of a zero sum game in the sense that a student is a student regardless of whether they're graduate or undergraduate. And so, I mean, that is, that's to put it very crudely because these students are, are weighted in the ministry's counting. But if you, if you assume the, the present conditions uh, continuing, uh, you cannot actually increase graduate student numbers without decreasing undergrad numbers or going uh, over the corridor. So I, none of this is easy, uh, but there are ways to, to begin to address this. And it's, I think, a, uh, a process that will take time and careful strategy. Also, it's unclear uh, what kind of long-term uh, uh, consistency we'll see from some of these government regulations over time. But uh, I, I hope that answers the question a bit. I'm, I, I, it's a very good question. Um, uh, we have to look for ways to find the resources uh, to grow and strengthen our research enterprise while not uh, running the risk of, of damaging uh, what is already a proven strength at the institution, that, that is undergrad learning. Uh, on the other hand, uh, to me, it's not acceptable to say, well, you know, in the absence of vast amounts of additional resources, there's no point. I think we have to strive and uh, the institution has to find ways to put its weight behind the research enterprise and to aspire very high. I talk a lot about partnerships, uh, in in the report on the conversation, and I, I actually do think, I mean, not not only through uh, advancement, where one always looks to for support uh, on the uh, on uh, um, strategic priorities for the university, but um, uh, also in terms of 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 leveraging our access to resources for research, uh, doing so through partnership with other institutions and so on, seems to me a, a very positive way forward. Most institutions face the same challenges we do. Um, our questions are dying down. I have one more, Patrick. I, I just want to say, though, uh, my dog was trying to have a conversation with your dogs when she heard them barking there a little <laughs> bit ago. Must be the time of day. Um, anxious to get outside, I think. 
Um, so uh, here we go. Yeah. You mentioned aversion to risk a few times in your report. Could you tell us where this aversion was most noted and also some examples which might be seen as higher risk that in your opinion would be worth considering? Hmm. Really good question. Um, I suppose in a way my answer to the last question uh, um, gets to the, the, the question of risks that would be worth considering. I mean, for us to make a substantial step forward in uh, our research profile um, and our research achievements, uh, we will have to be more aggressive at hiring and hiring strategically. Uh, uh, and then we will also have to be very thoughtful about ensuring that we have the facilities uh, in which to support those researchers we hire. And that is a, a significant challenge. And I think it will, it will, call, it will require the university to, yes, to, to embrace some risks, to take some uh, risks on our research future um, in, in order to help us uh, take the steps forward that we need to because of course in order to raise our research standing significantly um, it's going to take a considerable investment and so um, there will be a need to be somewhat i'm not suggesting incautious but somewhat less paralyzed by uh, um, cautiousness than we and many institutions sometimes have been um, Yes, I talk a lot about uh, risk aversion in, in the report on the conversation. And I, I would say um, the thing about it is that it is, in my assessment of it uh, over the, uh, the now getting on for two years I've been back at Queen's, um, it's a pernicious problem in the institution, uh, partly because of its honest roots. Um, by that, I mean, it has arisen naturally during a time of stress and challenge. Um, uh, so it's a problem partly because it has naturally evolved, but the, the, the bigger side of the problem is that it is everywhere. Um, uh, we had a very uh, helpful discussion about this at the board yesterday. I had a session with our board to talk about the vision and mission document. And one of the questions I put to the board was, um, how does risk fit into the formulation of strategy for the future, given the board's tolerance, uh, level of tolerance for, for risk? And obviously as trustees of the university, the board has a particular responsibility in that regard. So it, it's important to think through uh, uh, what risk at different levels of the institution means, what it means at the level of governance, what it means at the local level. Um, but it is everywhere. And I, I actually thought that one of the most crippling manifestations of aversion to risk that I noticed and heard about during the conversation was at the very, very local level, the failure of confidence in people who work here to, to have initiative, to bring forward a creative solution, uh, to be innovative, uh, to share information outside of their immediate sphere of influence that might have stimulated some kind of collaborative venture. Um, th this, uh, this kind of thing arises as does the bigger um, sort of institutional concern with risk that we, we, we see at the board, um, uh, partly from challenges of our history. So uh, I, I have the good fortune to come to Queen's at a time when uh, this institution had made extraordinarily sac extraordinary sacrifices and dealt with amazing financial challenges to get us to this point. Here I think of things like the, the reform to the pension plan, the creation of the, the joint pension plan with uh, two other sister institutions. A great deal of work has been done to, re to return Queen's to a position of financial good health and stability. And we're fortunate because we, I mean, you know, just over the last week or so, we have seen what the consequences have been of COVID for institutions that were not as assiduous about building their financial health. Um, so uh, that, that is a remarkable achievement for our university, but the cost of it 
over a decade, I would say, uh, is this risk aversion phenomenon. Um, and while you might say it gets in the way of really big ideas, you know, uh, I don't know, I just sort of suck one out of my thumb. I mean, let's open a school of social work, say. Um, yeah, there are risks and challenges in that kind of thinking, uh, but there are potentially long-term benefits. Academics gamble, have to gamble all the time because that's what academics do. You have to be thinking, uh, challenging received wisdom and so on. So that is healthy uh, risk-taking and that's still alive, but it's at that day-to-day -day level where the people uh, feel supported enough to have an idea that fails, potentially, or whether they feel supportive enough to demonstrate some initiative outside of the narrow parameters within which their job has been configured. Um, that I think is, is a critical issue. Um, and, and I think, you know, of all the things in the conversation, there are a couple of aspects to our culture that really will take concerted effort, but really will take time to alter. Uh, and this risk aversion thing is one of them. Um, I, 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 I think we have to take pleasure in the strengths of our institution. We have to support each other in being innovative and in coming up with great ideas. We have to support each other in being tolerant of things that don't work out. Uh, and the day-to-day -day operations at Queen's have to be less about self-protection and more about the greater good and the overall mission of the institution. Uh, Kathy Lemon has said, uh, you've used the term internationalization at home when reimagining our internationalization plan. And often folks do not understand what this term means. Can you give us your thoughts on what types of activities might fall into this category? And if you envision including and promoting an intercultural communication component into the academic lives of our students, that will not only give them the tools for their future careers, but will create a welcoming and inclusive environment at Queen's. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Uh, I do envisage that. Uh, I think, uh, I forget the, the language I, I have in the slide. At one time, that slide did say that um, this is the fourth of the strategicals. It did use the phrase internationalization at home. It now talks about curriculum reform intended to capture a pluralistic global environment. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why I've moved away from the, the internationalization at home language. But um, I am envisaging in part exactly what you described there, um, intercultural education uh, for students. I mean, it is, universities in their arrogance often assume that if you have a certain number of international students here, the domestic students will by default uh, assimilate some kind of uh, cross-cultural competence. And that's uh, not going to happen. I mean, it has to be deliberately cultivated. Queens has a long history, as you know better than anyone, um, a long history of being thoughtful about this whole question of intercultural or cross-cultural uh, education and thinking. And we need to return that to a position of importance in the experience that we give our students. I, I would also hasten to add, it needs to be an important part of the, the overall culture of the institution in which we all participate, but particularly if we're talking about uh, internationalization at home, um, that's, uh, that component for students is particularly important. Uh, for the benefit of everyone on the call, um, internationalization at home typically refers to measures uh, that uh, universities or other institutions take uh, to impart to students a, a global perspective or capacity for uh, communication and, and action across cultural boundaries uh, in the absence of international travel, which historically um, has been assumed to be the way in which students would get that. Um, uh, and the truth is that even uh, Canadian students are a stay-at-home bunch, and the percentage of Canadian students who do seek uh, experiences abroad is actually a very small percentage of the overall student body. And I, I, I believe that even amongst Queen students, um, the percentage is not much greater than, uh, than the national average. And I do remember 
being at a conference organized by the International Association of Universities some years ago, which they gave the global average for students uh, getting an international experience. And it was appallingly low, given that that average included also the European Union, where students, as a matter of course, do get international experiences. So um, all of which is to say, um, the overwhelming majority of our students uh, will not, during the course of their studies, have the opportunity uh, to have uh, a meaningful uh, experience in another culture or uh, crossing multiple cultural boundaries. And it is for that reason that it is critically important for a university to develop um, not just special programs that cultivate this, but um, an overall attitude to the educational mission that makes that cross-cultural competency a center of the student's education. So, I mean, when I talk about the proper internationalization of Queen's Changing Us, I'm thinking about that, not just that students can take a course, and not that that's what, what anybody would be suggesting, but that we think about the curriculum as a way that places a premium on those kinds of experiences. Um, the reason um, I've, I've removed the phrase internationalization at home and included this reference to a pluralistic global environment is it's a real mouthful that. And so I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, entirely happy with where that's landed, but it, this arises from a discussion that I know has been happening on uh, the one of the internationalization working groups that's been uh, uh, co coordinated by Sandra Donata to to make our to do our self assessment for the IAU internationalization advisory process we're going through, and it it has to do with the way in which the notion of home is problematized now. So long as we have an issue with EDII, so long as we continue to have challenges understanding what the applicability of that notion of home to the university is for diverse groups. Uh, internationalization at home presupposes a fixed notion of what quote unquote home is. Um, and so, so long as that's fluid, let's talk about it in slightly different ways. And that's, that's why the elaborate polysyllabic circumlocution used in my uh, in my slides is there. So I hope, uh, I hope Kathy, that answers the question a bit. Pretty much wraps up our questions for today. Oh, uh, I just had one more pop in. Did you wanna? Yeah, go ahead, let's do, do the last one. Uh, there's a tendency at Queen's to address problems or opportunities only within the confines of one's own unit, as you alluded to earlier. This is unlikely to change unless the strategic plan were to explicitly challenge all units at Queen's to proactively reach out and collaborate across portfolio and faculty boundaries as a matter of course, rather than the exception. In reality, all endeavors at Queen's are heavily interconnected, and most issues can only be solved by assuming a system perspective. How do you see us overcome the silo culture at Queen's? Great question. It's a great question. Um, I will say I'm, I'm very hopeful about this um, because over the last, uh, certainly in the, two, in the year and a half I've been back, uh, I've been struck by the number of initiatives undertaken um, uh, that have crossed faculty boundaries uh, I applaud the deans for a number of initiatives that they've come forward with in, in the last uh, uh, couple of months uh, that are of exactly the sort one would want. Um, so I think um, there is evidence that uh, there is a hunger for uh, these kinds of initiatives that, that enable people to get out of their silos. Um, but I think it's a very astute question, uh, especially that notion of a system perspective being necessary, because um, as always with these kinds of things, you know, um, behavior is explicable usually in quite complex ways. And it's not just that we are predisposed to be in silos. We have a long history of doing things that reinforce silos. We're a highly decentralized institution and the pressure to further decentralization comes not from a desire to see 
uh, a coming together across the institution around particular issues, but rather from now a longstanding desire to create kind of separate uh, areas of independent autonomous uh, activity. Um, that is reinforced uh, in, in uh, I, I, I think, a kind of, oh, uh, I was going to say a kind of chilling way, but I won't get melodramatic about it, is, is reinforced by the budget model, which served a particular purpose when it was put in place still serves some important positive purposes. But one thing it doesn't do is encourage the kind of system change that the question is talking about. Um, so uh, I think people will be encouraged to know that uh, as part of the budget discussions this year, there, there's been a great deal of discussion about the budget model and the need to, <coughs> to look at it and to consider again whether it serves our needs right now um, uh, as well as it did when it was first put in place. And I think it certainly does not serve our needs uh, uh, so long as we are reaching towards uh, uh, interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary initiatives and collaborations. Um, I talk in the report on the conversation at some length about behaviors that the budget model uh, reinforces. And I think if we want to see changes in those behaviors, um, we have to see a change in the mechanisms that give rise to them. This question intersects, interestingly, with the risk aversion question. There is cost to someone who reaches out from one unit to another seeking uh, collaboration. Um, the cost may well be uh, um, active obstruction, but what's most likely to be the case uh, is that eventually by a process of uh, steady attrition, it will become too difficult to sustain uh, a cross-disciplinary collaboration in the face of everything that favors individual units and the reinforcement of silos. So we really do need to change some fundamental aspects of the system in, in order to, uh, to address that. I it, it's, it's a great question, and um, uh, if, if we want to see progress in this way, we really do have to go into this with, with our eyes open and see the way in which all components of this institution work together. They work together either to, uh, to militate against certain kinds of collaborative outcomes, uh, or they can be made to, to work in support of those but making the systemic adjustments, I think is critically important. Yeah, so I think that brings us to the end of our discussion here, Patrick, unless you have any other comments you'd like to wrap up with. I, I don't have anything to add. I think you know, people have heard enough of my, my voice over the, the last hour and a bit. I, I do want to say thanks very much everybody for these, these great questions uh, and and the thoughtfulness behind them, which is really very helpful in this process. And do please uh, continue to uh, let me know your thoughts uh, by, by uh, uh, communicating with me through one of the ways I suggested, either through the, the website or through uh, emailing me at principal at queensu.ca. I'm really interested to, to hear, hear from you and hear your thoughts um, uh, and to... I, my commitment is to make whatever adjustments are needed to be made to this framework uh, to capture the, the aspirations and the, the efforts and hopes of the university community. So do please do whatever you can to make your thoughts known. So thanks everyone. And thanks Mary Beth for, and, and Keith for, for, for managing the technical side of, to, of today's meeting and uh, really grateful to everyone. Thanks so much. Look forward to the next time. Bye.